Brilliant. So welcome everyone to this UKRN workshop organized by Alexa UK on fair data in the life sciences beyond theory. So I hope that this will give you some more than just the principles and fair data and you can see some use cases and you can also hear about some of the resources that, that we're going to be presenting today. But before that, I'd like to talk about the data challenges today in the alliances. So why are we here? Why are we talking about fair data? We're here because there's data challenges in the life sciences that although they are not only applying to the life sciences, they apply to all the fields, these are particularly true to the life sciences. So there's a challenge of data growth, there's a challenge of diversity of data, geographic spread, and obviously sensitive data. So I guess many of you have seen this, like most domains, life sciences also face the same issue of data volumes increasing due to falling costs of data generation technologies. And in the last two years, this has been particularly true in the life sciences. In this graph you see here, is only showing the data until 2019. So the volume of data that the pandemic has generated has made this challenge even larger. There's also a diversity of data challenge. So as I said, we have many different data types, many different databases across the entire globe. And these are resources that, as you know, they're not separate, they are interlinked, they are entwined. So this diversity of data is a bit challenging in the life sciences. We have data coming from different technologies, sequence, proteomics, different ontologies, standards and formats. The standards and regulations that, for, for example, you need for human genome and health data are very different to the ones that you use for plant data, for example. And the geographic spread, the data edition is also a big challenge, is increasing every year. And you can see here the distribution of sequencing machines globally from Illumina, LiveTech, PacBio, Nanopore. And this only applies to sequencing data. So unlike all the disciplines where data is generated from single sites or a small number of sites in the life sciences, data is generated really across the globe. There's no spot that is left untouched. And obviously there's also a usage of data. This geographic spread is not just about generating, it's about using it. So as you can see here, an image from Envol UBI, this is just a snapshot of a live map indicating the uses of data across the entire globe. So having this in mind, having these challenges in mind, it is now more than ever essential to think about fair data. So just a reminder for all of you here, I'm sure you know what fair means, but a reminder that this means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And you'll hear much more about this, Alison and Manasa talking afterwards. So I imagine most of you today here have already heard about this. You've heard the principles and most likely read the original article published in 2016 on the fair guiding principles. But since then, much work has been done by the scientific community on applying these principles. Yet the resources are not widely used by all life science researchers. So we're here today to give you a sample of those achievements and advancements, and hopefully that you put this into practice after, after this workshop. So for the first part of the workshop, we'll have two talks focusing on the tools that help the scientific community put the FAIR data principles into practice. First, we'll have Manas and Jabi from the University of Manchester talking about the RDM kit and followed by Alison Lister from the University of Oxford, who will be introducing the FAIR cookbook and FAIR sharing as guidance and discovery for enabling FAIR data. We'll have a panel discussion with both of them, so you can ask any questions after the two talks. And we'll also have a short break of 10 minutes, after which we'll have the second part of the workshop that is going to focus not only on the tools, but how we're going to bridge the skill gap. We're talking about FAIR, we're talking about the tools that are out there, but how are we going to train a life sciences workforce to use this? So you're going to hear from three projects under the UKRI funding for data science training in health and bioscience. The first two projects presented by myself and Thomas Silensky will showcase data management training initiatives and resources that have been done in this project that you can already use. And then finally, you'll hear from CloudSpan project that will showcase the use of how to make data fair, also for training materials. So Evelyn Greaves from the University of York, she will present this example from one of these projects where they've implemented the FAIR principles in so many different areas of life sciences. They are implementing this on training materials as well. So this is 
it from me. And without further ado, I want to please um, ask Manasa and Javi to join us and present the IDM kid. She has extensive experience in data management and coordinates the community of data management at the University of Manchester and is one of the leading voices in the IDM kit, the first resource that you're gonna hear about today. Hi, thank you, Shania. I'm just gonna share my screen first to make sure everything is okay. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, okay, perfect. great. So full screen mode? Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks, Shania. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, thank you, Shania, for the introduction. So as Shania said, I'm going to talk about RDM Kit and I'm going to dive deep dive directly into it because we don't have a lot of time as I understand that we just have 10 minutes or 10 to 15 minutes here. So I'm just going to go directly into it. Uh, okay. So as Shenya rightly pointed out, all of you know about FAIR data and the findable, accessible, interoperable. My point in uh, bringing that up again is because just, to rem just a brief reminder that whatever tools we are talking about or whatever we are going to use uh, for our data, our ulti ultimate aim is um, FAIR data management and uh, having all those four pillars of FAIR fulfilled. So keeping that in mind, so. What is happening is, as Shania mentioned, there's a huge amount of data that has come up, not only in life sciences, but in all other fields. And especially we are, since we are working in life sciences, so we would talk about that. Now, the point is there is a lot of support uh, for data management, it's overwhelming and there are because there are so many data initiatives, but at the same time, the support is also underwhelming from at the organization level or at the tools that are available there, because sometimes the, uh, um, information that you have is too generic, or sometimes it is too specific, or sometimes you don't know where to start from. So uh, you might be a researcher, so your needs are different. You might be a data steward, so your needs will be different. You might be a project manager, so you will be looking at it differently. And then you might be a funder or a policymaker, so you will look at data management differently from the above. So um, in a nutshell, there is a lot of information there about data management, what to do, when to do, and but there is also a need for a streamlined process to know when to start and what, what exactly to do, what and what does data management entail? So what we have here is RDM kit. When we came together to build this toolkit, which is called the Research Man Data Management Toolkit for Life Sciences. So the point here for RDM kit is that it has best practices and guidelines. So it has an overarching knowledge of what you should be doing for data management, where you should start, how you should go through the different stages of the data, and how you should be in the end uh, sending it to repositories or preserving it for a long time. Now, the point of RDM Kit is it is a very broad overarching information that will get you started. It will also go into specifics, but sometimes when we are lost, we don't know where to start. So this is a good kickstart. It will also tell you what you need to consider or take into account when performing data management at different um, stages. Most importantly, it will give you the practical approaches to navigate through the plethora of available data management resources. There are tools, there are standards, there are databases and registries. And I'm, I know you will hear about all of this from Alison. Uh, so I'm not going into detail here. So um, keep in mind that RDM kit is an umbrella on top of all of these tools, re resources, registries. It will get you give you a kickstart. So that is how you should look at RDM kit. Having said that, uh, so what is actually RDM Kit? How do you use it? Going a bit more into the detail here. So first of all, RDM Kit will uh, support you through the life cycle of your project. You know, we now look at data at data as a life cycle. That data has different stages of life. life different data goes through different stages through its life cycle, starting from the time when you start to write a project application. So you need to have a data management plan. Then you go through all of those uh, spokes of the wheel uh, till you end uh, the data where you want to submit it to a repository or share it publicly or in the end, archive it. So now RDM Kit helps you go through all of these. Secondly, it is a focal point for information, best practices and examples, but it 
it does not have just one way of navigating it. It has multiple ways of navigating it. So you can look at data management from the life cycle point of view, or if you're a data steward or a researcher, you might look into specifically what your role is and how that should support data management. Then we go into your domain. By your domain means, for example, maybe you are from the microbial biotechnology or you're de dealing with imaging data or you're dealing with the transcriptomic data. So you need some, while the general data management uh, principles might be same, but there are some specifics which you need to follow for your own particular field. Then, uh, or you can go through your tasks, which will be simple data management planning. How do you do sharing? How do you do transfer of data? So you'll get best practices and guidelines for this. Then we have tool assemblies. Uh, I will come to it in a bit because it's better to show it graphically, but what we do in tool assemblies is put together all the tools that are needed to manage your data better at different stages of the data life cycle. Then we have national resources page where we go into country specific guidelines. And in the end, we also have, if, you just don't, if you're just looking for some particular or specific resources and tools for data management, you can just simply search them through our tools list here. And you can also find a lot of training material related to the topic you're interested in linked at the bottom of each page, which you have seen. And then again, we also have, so we are not doing it in isolation. RDM Kit is not a world in its own. So we're integrating it with all other resources that are available uh, for data management. For example, Fair Cookbook, which Alison will talk about, Fair Sharing, Alison will talk about that. We also have the data stewardship visit. So we are trying to build a world where you have all of these tools available to you to do the data management in the best possible way. But have a good kickstart for you and have a good understanding because to start to get into deeper deeper uh, echelons of information you first need to know what is the problem you're addressing and from what point of view you're addressing it without uh, taking any more time on this i will now go a bit into the details of the RDM kit. As I've already mentioned to you, there are multiple ways of navigating the information that is available on the um, RDM kit. And this is just to make it easy for you and just to benefit you in the best possible manner. So let's go into it. And as I mentioned, there's also the possibility. So if you don't want to go into each specific section, you can just straight away search in our search bar, whatever you're looking for, and you may be taken directly there. Hitting the first thing. So now if you want information about the data life cycle, as I said, there are multiple stages of a data life cycle, and you may want to know about, let's say, what to do when you're planning for data management, that is when you're starting the project. So in this, if you click on the spoke of the wheel in this section, what you'll find about is a general description about planning of data. You'll have a list of considerations and possibly um, some solutions to what to those considerations. You'll have training materials that will be linked to this, and then there'll also be possible links to to data stewardship wizard or, for example, in the planning stage uh, to the data management planning softwares that will help you to make your data fair from the beginning. In a similar manner, you can go through all of these stages and you'll find relevant information about these. For example, in case of uh, the cycle, if maybe you're looking for data sharing and you will have information like this, what is data sharing? And it will also be linked to other information like data transfer. There will also be relevant tools and resources that you might need for data sharing and data transfer among either within the collaborators or to the outside world once you are done. Then in case of maybe you have some um, country specific rules for certain kinds of data because we have data like sensitive data or human data, which has a lot of GDPR and related issues attached to it. And then each country has specific ethical guidelines and you might find that information also related to it. Second, as I said, that you may be a researcher or you may be a policymaker or you might be a data steward. So your requirements of data stewardship might be different. So you can search the RDM kit from the point of view of your role, what kind of role you play and what is the information that you need for data management. Of course, this is based on the data stewardship competency framework produced by the uh, Netherlands, uh, Alexia Netherlands and the DTL there. It's a very comprehensive role and information about uh, different types of uh, data stewards that are um, in the field today that are here that are working to help you with data management. 
uh, next. So as I said, this might be one of the most useful uh, section for you, your tasks, because you might want to know about all of these issues when you're managing your data, for example, compliance monitoring, or for example, data analysis, what do I need to keep in mind when I'm doing data analysis? Or what do I need to do uh, if I have sensitive data? How do I protect my data? How do I anonymize my data? Or, and then again about do I need to use identifiers, persistent identifiers, what kind of licensing do I need to be using for my data, if I have sensitive data, what are the GDPR rules that apply to my data, so all such information you will be able to find under your tasks and it will make your um, data management easier and you'll be well prepared by the time you finish your data or you're ready to share your data with your collaborators. As I said, for example, one of the most important tasks that you will uh, take care of when you're doing a project is data management plan, which you will need even before you've started your project. This is a requirement for most of the fund funding bodies. And here on this page, you'll find detailed information about data management plan, data management plans of various funding organizations in Europe uh, and UK, and uh, some of the online tools that are available to prepare your data management, especially, for example, you, then there's also information about sensitive data, as I mentioned, that this is a very important field where you need anonymization, where you need to follow GDPR. So you need to be very well aware of what you're doing with the data. So you'll find all relevant information here. Next, as I said, some of you who are here today, uh, this will be very important for your domain. Let's say you're working in plant sciences, or let's say you're working in human data. So you will have all the information related to the human data um, uh, that is here uh, that you need for data management of human data. Again, human data is a very sensitive field. You might need anonymization, et cetera. So you need to be prepared for what you're dealing with. Um, Another example could be, uh, for example, we have liaised with the 3D bioinformatics community in the Alexia itself, and uh, where we put together some information about the structural bioinformatics. Uh, structural bioinformatics is in itself a very vast field, but we've started with a small group, for example, uh, the structural um, bioinformatics and protein-protein interactions or protein-DNA interactions. So you will find that information here. So um, all of the audience who is here today, if you find, I would just like to put this out there, if you find that your domain is not covered in this section and you may want uh, your domain to be covered. So please get in touch with us and I will give more information about that towards the end of this uh, presentation. Next thing is, this is what I was talking about when I said that we have tool assemblies. And by tool assemblies, what we mean is that there are different stages of the data life cycle that the data goes through. You might be collecting, analyzing, preserving, sharing. So all of these all of these stages require different type of management of your data to have it there in the best possible way. So what we are doing is, or some of the uh, uh, institutes or some of the organizations have already put together these tool assemblies where they assemble all the tools that will be required at each stage of data for it to be managed um, correctly and appropriately. Uh, for example, this is a um, uh, data tool assembly from the uh, Norwegian Center, it's called NELS, and it has put together um, this tool assembly that will be used uh, at each stage of data management. For example, the, for metadata tracking, they're using the FairDM C. Uh, for making a data management plan, they have used a data stewardship wizard, and, and in the end, they are using the Alexia deposition databases for depositing data, so on and so forth. So it's basically pulling to making a pipeline of all the tools that is required for management of your data in a better way. We have some examples, uh, field specific, uh, organization specific of tool assemblies that are there in the RDM kit. And again, if you find you, there is something that needs to be gone there from your side, please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, then, as I mentioned, we have the national resources page where you have country specific guidelines, funder policies that are specific to a country or data management resources that are available within your country for you to use. So these go down under the under the national resources page. Um, again, you have, um, for example, for now we have like nine or 10 countries listed there. They have specified their own uh, data management guidelines that is specific to their country. Some of them can be generic also, but some of these rules and the policies are country specific. So all this information is there. So you can use the national resources page to look what is available in your country. 
Um, these are a couple of last slides, which I will not go into detail again, because Alison will be covering them. But what I'm showing here is, as I said uh, in the beginning, that we cannot work in isolation. Science in general does not work in isolation. We cannot have an RDM kit and put all this information there and not lies with other in important tools for databases or standards or policies that are available there. For example, if you need tools information, there is Delixia Bio tools. If you want to know about standards, databases, policies, there is fairsharing.org. Then if you need training materials, there is the Elixir test. So my point of saying all of this is while there is information about data management on the RDM kit, but it is well integrated with other tools, services, and register registries that are available. Uh, only the important thing here is that might help you these tools and registries and databases are placed in a narrative context so that you don't get lost. What exactly is this registry for? Why do I need this or how do I use this? So that is where RDM kit is going to help you and guide you to use these um, available tools and resources. Uh, lastly, I would again like to reiterate, we work very closely with the FAIR cookbook and with the data stewardship team uh, to make all of these tools integrated in both ways. So if you go to FAIR cookbook, for example, you will find links back to RDM kit telling you that if you need to know more broad level information about this, please go and check in RDM kit and vice versa. Similarly, in the data stewardship visit for each topic that we have covered in the RDM kit, there is also a link to the DSW um, uh, if there is relevant information or relevant data management plans and questionnaire on the DSW, you will find information linked in both directions. Uh, lastly, what I would like to say, I hope I'm in time, uh, what I would like to say is that in RDM Kit, the most important thing about RDM Kit that you need to know that it is a resource for the life scientists by the life scientists. So that is why we have an open contribution and editorial process. So anybody who wants to contribute can get in touch with us via GitHub or Google Doc or via the email that is available um, in, on our website uh, for the editorial um, team of ours. You can get in touch with us, raise an issue, and you will go through a process where the author is guided guided by the editor, we have a discussion whether we want this content on the RDM kit, and then you start writing the content. And then your content will go through a reviewing process. Um, of course, all the contributors get 100% uh, credit, they'll be acknowledged at the bottom of the page that who has written this. Um, but you're oh, welcome to join um, the contributors, or, or even for that matter of fact, the editorial board. Now, how to contribute to the RDM kit? As I said, it's an open community and we welcome everybody. So you will find all this information about how to contribute uh, on the uh, RDM kit website. You'll find a section called contribute and all this information is there. And uh, for more information, please visit the RDM kit website. There is uh, all the information for contribution, the editorial processes, what you need to do, and how can you get in touch with us. All of that information is there. And with that, I would like to thank, of course, the RDM kit is a product of the Elixir Converge project. And we have an amazing uh, editorial team and, of course, the uh, contributors and partners. So this wouldn't have been uh, possible without their help. I'm sorry, I think I have clicked something and my screen has gone. Uh, yeah. We, we can still see your PowerPoint, Unasa. I know, but it's, it's gone <laughs> off the, yeah, it's gone off the sharing. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wanting to keep the QR code there. So if you um, need any further information, please do get in touch with us. And with that, I will end my uh, talk. I'm sorry for speaking very fast because I know I had very little time and a lot to cover, but I'll be happy to answer any questions from now. Thanks. Thank you very I'll much. Stop Vanessa. sharing my screen. I've put as well the RDM kit link on the chat so that participants can see the resource as well. Great, thank you. I can already see that you have a few questions that I hope we can resolve as well in the panel discussion that we're going to have with Alison and Manasa. And I think some of them will apply to both of you. So I really look, look forward to hearing your answers. So Alison, I, I'd like you to, to start your presentation because I think there's, there's so much synergism between the RDM kit and what you are going to present that I think this is going to be extremely useful for our participants. So I'll give it all to you. Thank you. Thank you. And Manasa, thank you for the lovely introduction as well as Xenia, thank you for the lovely introduction, because we certainly do have a lot to cover today. And I will jump straight in. But th with the help of the previous speakers, I feel like I can jump straight in without too much worry about uh, about the introductions. 
Bearing in mind, though, of course, that we all have a few bits of introductions to give. Mine is that I'm Alison Lister and I work for Fair Sharing and the group that Fair Sharing is produced in also produces the Fair Cookbook and I am also involved in the production of the Fair Cookbook. So I get to talk to you about two great resources. Um, I want to just start with <laughs> the sort of almost identical slide to what has been seen before, but just to focus on the fact that FAIR is a continuum. It's aspirational and there's no one solution for, uh, you don't have to feel that your group needs to comply with one particular solution that worked for someone else because FAIR was deliberately created to have options and a range of solutions. And the other thing I just want to focus on is that FAIR doesn't necessarily mean open. And this is one of the things that I often get asked about when giving such presentations. You know, you can still be fair and not be open because there's certain times in which that's really important, such as for sensitive data. But to give you just a few examples to bear in mind as we go through the fair cookbook and fair sharing in a whirlwind tour of these resources, I want to just give you some examples of what it means to be fair. So, for example, findability can be expressed with persistent identifiers to retrieve and connect data and accessibility can be um, exemplified by, by understanding how data is accessed. So information about the accessibility, how open is it and how open does it need to be? So as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. Interoperability, what comes into play there is the metadata that you're providing because the more metadata you can provide and more importantly, the more relevant metadata to your research area, the more likely you are to be discovered by other people and other researchers. And in terms of reusability, there's two ways of looking at it. There's the use of controlled vocabularies and terminologies to ensure that everyone's talking about the same thing, but also there is the use of licensing and, and understanding the, the qualifications, the, the requirements for, for reusing data. So within that context and thinking about things like uh, metadata and persistent identifiers and licensing and security, we come to the FAIR cookbook, which is a, an elixir, elixir resource that's open to all and has been developed together with the European research programs. We have the NIH also, Office of Data Science Strategy, and with, within industry and the Pistoia Alliance. There is a preprint available at this DOI, and there's already a manuscript submitted as well. So that provides a lot of the context just uh, published this month to give you some more detailed information on the cookbook. So remembering that FAIR is a continuum and there are lots of different solutions. Well, how do you know what the right solution is for you? And what was the point of creating the FAIR cookbook in the first place to address this? Well, there are a lot of documents out there to help you understand FAIR and be FAIR, but the majority of them are more generic and they provide non-specific guidance both within and without the life sciences. And there was a real need for practical examples that, that provided targeted solutions for, for people who wish to enable FAIR data on a practical sense. And the FAIR cookbook put, brings together both academia and industry to uh, promote and make the case for FAIR data management. So what is for the FAIR cookbook? It's a collection of recipes. As the name implies, a cookbook has recipes. And just like the recipes you make in the kitchen are very practical with itemized ingredients and step-by-step -step instructions, that is what you will find at the FAIR cookbook. And these recipes are designed for the life sciences, though there is absolutely no reason why it couldn't be extended to other areas that will help you make and keep your data fair. Who is it for? Well, all sorts of different stakeholders, just like Manas I said for the RDM, RDM kit, there's lots of different reasons to visit both of our resources. Now, you, there are the recipes that I describe, which are hands-on technical examples or introductory materials, which benefit researchers and data scientists, but also draw towards the data facilitators and data support roles, such as data stewards and data curators. For them, you've got practical examples and educational material, uh, ways in which they can use these practical examples within their own educational material. And you have policymakers and funders coming to really um, advertise the ways in which you can practically implement the FAIR data that they're requiring. And FAIR Cookbook is really a place to share your approaches 
to and your and the way that you and the services that you have to support verification and really is a community for promoting the sort of culture of participation to to share your expertise so who developed it we had as i said before a combination of academia and industry that came together um, within the FAIR Plus project to create FAIR Cookbook. And also we've had the backing across a number of different Elixir nodes with it, lots of them being well represented within the FAIR Cookbook. So what does the FAIR Cookbook cover? Well, there's a variety of different routes in, a bit like how um, Mumza mentioned with RDM Kit. We have over 70 recipes and nearly 100 authors contributing at the moment. And there are lots of different ways in which you can find the route in. So you could, for example, go to a technical process. So for example, find those resources, those recipes linked to omics or preclinical or clinical research, but there's more than just those. So you can also look uh, according to the part of the FAIR principles that you wish to learn about. And so with FAIR Cookbook, you can learn how to improve the fairness of your data with using exemplar data sets and practical examples. As I said, you can understand the levels and indicators used. I say assess fairness, but that's probably a strong word used to um, determine your level of knowledge of the FAIR principles. You can also investigate and learn about open source technologies that are used to help enable FAIR, find skills, that you might you might need learn about learn various skills, and if we look more precisely at the various goals that different users might have, let's say you want to make your content more visible, well then you'd be looking in the findability section. Let's say you want to integrate your data in a semantically meaningful way with other data sets, you'd look under interoperability or in the infrastructure section. And of course, if if what you need is is information on security and sensitive data then you're going to be looking under accessibility and reusability. And each of these goals, each of these sections will present you with a set of recipes that will give you practical knowledge on how to enable FAIR data in a stepwise manner. And not only that, but each recipe recommends further reading so that you can create a chain of resources, build up a set of recipes that will help you, oh no, I can't do it, but I'm going to have to make a meal of enabling FAIR data. I apologize for that pun. I, I thought of it and I couldn't stop myself. So what you also have are the search features. This is the new FAIR cookbook search wizard, which allows you to, it's a more compressed view, but allows you to look at a lot of different features within each recipe. How long will it take me to read it? Does it have ex executable code that I can test? What are the roles? What's uh, similar to the roles that we've heard, heard uh, people talking about today in the workshop? What roles are these recipes intended for? And what is the maturity level that um, our data will gain by following the recipe as laid out? And let's just take a little more moment, a little more of a minute on this maturity level. So what you're looking at here is the summary card that's available at the top of every recipe. That's what you can see on the left. In this case, the recipe is called Introducing Unique Persistent Identifiers. It's going to take you 30 minutes and it doesn't have any executable code, but it does have a difficulty level of three out of five. And this recipe gives you background information on persistent identifiers. It gives you a list of audience uh, roles of people who might find this recipe interesting, and it has this maturity level, an indicator. So this maturity level was created uh, with, within the FAIR Plus project as a separate output to the FAIR cookbook. And it, specifies the maturity level uh, that may be achieved if you follow the recipe. And sometimes one or more recipes may be needed to fulfill a maturity level. And what you can do is it looks a lot across three different, uh, three different axes, I guess you'd say, of maturity. Uh, that's representation, hosting, and content. The C in this maturity level indicator indicates content. And I won't go into any more detail around that other than to say that it really does help you gain an awareness of, of, of what you will get as a skill or as a, an end product for uh, when you buy by following this recipe. So how can you join in? We have, as I say, over 70 recipes, but anyone can be a part of this. 
this is this is started uh, in the context of one project within a collaboration of a number of different organizations, both in academia and in industry, but that doesn't mean it's limited to those original collaborators. So what you do is you have a look at the fair cookbook, you have an idea for a recipe, identify a chapter and a topic that you would like to be interested in, that you would like to write a recipe for. You can choose a, one of a many different ways of contributing and writing the recipe, and there are guidelines available for that. And then, of course, you can submit your idea online. And there is an editorial board that works with the Fair Cookbook to ensure consistency of writing and appropriateness of recipes. And if you do this, you will get credit for it, because as we've all said today, credit and attribution are really important. You have expertise that you are providing to create this, and we would like to reward you for it. So when you create with, uh, with Fair Cookbook, not only do you get your name and your affiliation, you get links out to ORCID, and we use the credit attribution ontology to identify your role in writing the recipe itself. What does a recipe look like? It has, I've realized that animation isn't quite working as I expected. We've got a workflow at the top that gives you a visualization of what the recipe will do. You've got a list of the tools that will be needed for the recipe. You get code snippets and step-by-step -step processes and guidelines to help you work through the recipe and conclusions and references to tell you where to go next. Not just within the Fair Cookbook, but to things like the RDM kit and various other links out. So additionally, as, as well as the RDM kit, we have other links to other Elixir resources, fair sharing, which I'll briefly touch upon very briefly in a moment, and things like BioTools and RDM kit, which has already been talked about. And that does lead us nicely on to fair sharing. So the majority of my talk was always intended to be about fair cookbook and those practical recipes. But all of these different tools that we've been talking about need to discuss the databases and the standards and the data policies uh, and the connectedness among them. And that's what fair sharing gives you information about. We describe these resources and more importantly, the relationships among them. And you can see that there are over 1600 standards represented with us and more than 1900 databases of a variety of different types, as you can see here. And if we look a little more closely to the life sciences, you can see that there are over a thousand standards that are specifically dealing within the life sciences from uh, grassroots organizations, as well as more formalized standards organizations. And the way in which our societies and organizations and institutes tend to come to us is either to discover content or to add content. And if you're adding it, you have a variety of different reasons. And often you'll create a corresponding collection, which is a branded page on fair sharing that allows you to group these resources however you need for your purposes. And these might be resources developed by a community or by a standards development organization recommended by a community or even mapped. Like when there was recent crosswalk work within the RDA, within lots of other resources, the equivalent collection was created to create a live view of the resources and landscape most important to you. So this is an example of the EOSC life graph, of course, which uh, Elixir is a part. And this shows all the resources uh, and uh, the, all the data resources, that is the standards and the databases that are affiliated with EOSC life. And of course, this brings together a relationship of those associated organizations as well. Uh, just to summarize in a final slide, you go to the Fair Cookbook for practical recipes that link out to a number of different tools, such as RDM kits, such as BioTools, such as Fair Sharing. And not only can you use these recipes to learn in a very practical step-by-step -step level how to enable your Fair data, but you can also create the content there itself. And the same for Fair Sharing. You can come to us to discover the resources you need to store your data in a fair way, to structure your data in a fair way. And you can also use fair sharing to advocate for any resources you personally develop, any databases, any standards, and make them more discoverable to your particular research community. So I just want to say thank you very much. And I have hit my 15 minutes exactly where I was hoping to. And I am really looking forward to the little Q&A period we have after and welcome any questions we might have. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. I'm, I'm very amazed at how timely you both have been. <laughs>
<laughs> and and this is this is really a lot of information to put into 15 and 10 minutes so uh, amazing really thank you so much to both of you i want to have a look at the questions that we have in the chat because i think this this one in particular might be relevant to both of you from tony brooks he asks about who decides what tools and standards and combinations thereof get into your list. What is the basis of those decisions? And I think this applies to all the resources that have been discussed by both of you. So I don't know, Manasa Allison, who wants to jump in first? Manasa, why don't you go first and I'll follow? Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, so for us, for RDM Kit, it, it is simple. Uh, so I think it's better that I go in first because as I said, everything is put in a context there. And by context, we meant for your domain or the task, for example, if you're doing data management, then we try to pick out all the tools that are available there for creating a data management plan. Now, if you go into domains, if you're talking about, say, bioimaging data, then we all need to take on the tools and resources that are a part and that are used in that community or are built for that kind of field. So for us, it's very simple. For us, uh, we for us, it's task-based or it's the domain-based or it's the kind of information that is being written about, the context that has been created and any relevant tools and resources, training materials to that particular topic, uh, that is what is being included in that uh, subject. I'm not sure if it's um, if it's about whether or not individual researchers or research supporter support roles can come to you and submit, or it, uh, can you let us know if we're getting the idea of the question, Tony? Yeah, guys. First, thanks a lot for all the great work. I mean, and the great presentations. Really good job today. Um, I actually came to this meeting just by mistake. I thought I was going to do a different one, but I'm really glad I did because this is fantastic work to see. Um, I got my links mixed up. Um, anyway, so thanks for trying to answer the question. I guess, you know, what, what we can see, especially in those latter slides there, was how complicated, how many tools, how many data sets, how many standards, right? And how many different ways they're being used. It's, you know, I almost find myself thinking with so much complexity, does it really help to have it all in one place because I'm still confused, right? And so, you know, one could argue, I'm not arguing, but one could argue that there should be some selection. These are the better tools. These ones have been proven to work more effectively, right? I'm, I'm uncomfortable about that because obviously then that brings in biases and polit politics and everything else. But, but it just made me wonder whether, um, whether there was any kind of selection going on here right um on whatever basis and who made those selections on, on on what with whatever justifications or whether it is you know anything you can find or anything anyone throws at you gets in your lists so it's really it's really that kind of question Melissa, why don't you go first again and then i'll and then i'll just complete the answer for myself um yeah um uh, thank you tony <laughs> i'm glad your links got mixed <laughs> um what i will say is that as i said that the whole point of RDM kit is to build a context. So when we build a context, and again, as I said, RDM kit is a resource for life scientists by the life scientists. So the people who are actually working in that particular domain or field are providing this information. So they know what is what are the tools available there. Now coming to the second question of what is good or kind of giving it a rating. No, we are not doing that for exactly the same reasons as you mentioned, there'll be biases and there will be, we'll have favorites. Or for example, we'll just try to only promote Elixir related resources and tools. So no, we don't do that. Uh, mostly, uh, most of the tools that are there, these are the tools that the people from the community are, work, are using. Uh, for their um, data management. So that's what our criteria is. So we, for very right reasons, as you pointed out, we cannot do uh, the rating of the tools. Very nice. And certainly some of the aspects of my answer will be identical to yours. Certainly, uh, if I go backwards and start from what Manazas said and then, and then work back to the first part of the question, I will say that we did think a lot about evaluation of resources because the type of metadata we store. So in our databases, we have metadata fields that align with RDA outputs uh, according to what attributes the RDA recommends that our databases are described with. Are there any data access conditions? Are there any data deposition conditions? Is versioning allowed? Is there embargo of the data? And so we do have all that information, but we made the similar decision to not assess or evaluate uh, according to any of these fields, we would curate them 
and we would make them available both on our API and uh, to the humans accessing our interface. But we leave it to the tools that are using our API. Data Stewardship Wizard is one of them. You, you inter it integrates nicely with the API. And when you're building your data management plan, the, the resources available from fair sharing appear in the Data Stewardship Wizard. Uh, but even as we are helping to create a list of fair valuation tools, which you can find on our sister site, fairassist.org, we are leaving it to them to perform the assessments because even for them, they're starting to have workshops and get togethers and hackathons to try to understand how they can speak a common language when each of them are performing their own evaluations and assessments. So it's quite a big field and one that we have chosen to be deliberately agnostic about. Um, it may be that ultimately with community uh, communities requesting it, we might present some of the results each of these, uh, each of these tools provide, but we will remain neutral. And I think that's really important. In terms of who decides what goes in fair sharing, we have a small in-house curation team, which will add resources as required as we find them. But we also have a very large and vibrant uh, maintainer community of over 1,000 users who uh, claim their records with fair sharing and keep them up to date. And anyone can be a user, uh, a user, a maintainer with us. So that means you go on, you log in with your ORCID and suddenly you're in, you can create records. So whatever you want, as long as it fits in our scope, you can have in. And not only that, we have a new community curation program where we're getting domain experts coming in and overseeing sections of fair sharing to make sure that our, our records are describing accurately and completely within their domain. So if anyone here is interested in that, we are absolutely always welcoming new applicants to the program. And within Fair Cookbook, it's a similar situation. So if you want to participate and build a recipe in the Fair Cookbook, all you have to do is think of the recipe you want, contact Fair Cookbook and get started. So they also welcome uh, new recipes from, from anyone. I quickly just don't want to dominate, so I'll be real quick here. Thank you for those answers. Thank you for taking that approach, both of you. And, and I think it reflects what Alison stressed at the start of your talk, um, which was that fair is not uh, an all or nothing. You're not fair or not fair. It's absolutely a continuum. Um, and you should probably start with the easiest stuff, quick wins, and not try okay. to go all the way in one go. Um, and that there's not one technology. Fair doesn't mean you know, RD, it, it's all in RDF format. FAIR doesn't mean you use this Global Alliance standard rather than any other standard. It's it's really, there's a whole range of technologies and solutions and it's a continuum. I think that's come through clearly today and I, I really appreciate that you, you made that point. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sonny. That was a great, great question. I also see another question that um, I might be able to answer, but might be wrong from Simon Berendez. It says, does the website indicate which tools can be used free of charge? And this was referring to IBM Kit. I think there's no tool there that is not free of charge. Is that right? Um, I would not say that is, I would say that's okay. not right because there might be, for example, again, from the uh, Eurobioimaging community, they talk about uh, certain softwares that are particular uh, to that um, field of science and they might have uh, licenses and, uh, you know, they might have a free form, but they might also have licenses. So I don't think, I don't think there are many that are not free. Most of them are open access, but there might be, depending on the field from which you're coming, there might be field specific tools and lists there which might be paid or at least partially paid depending on the level of advancement for Thanks, with, regards, with regards to fair cookbook um i don't exactly know the details of all the tools that are used um in there but i don't expect so don't quote me on this because uh, that particular level of detail i i haven't looked into recently but I think that the majority of them would be open access tools because you would need to include them in, a re in order to include them and have them make sense in a, in a recipe. You'd have to be able to download and use them. Uh, within fair sharing, we provide metadata that allows you to know whether a database is uh, open access. I mentioned this data access condition fields that we have. So you can say whether your database is open or controlled or partially open. So that allows for things like, well, we have all open data except where the data is sensitive or we allow open access to data to those of us, those users who pay us money and, get, and have gold open access so that their data can be seen by everyone. But if you deposit your data for free, then we keep it private. And so there are a few databases like that. And we try to capture that in these metadata fields, which can be filtered in the search facets. And same for standards. Some standards like the ISO standards, you have to pay to read the ISO standards. 
So that will be represented on our standards records uh, with information by saying, you can access the specification here, but this specification is behind a paywall. Thank you, Alison. Thank you to both of you. I think we are running out of time now. We are we already passed into our break, so we have now 10 minutes uh, break. Sorry, Shania, there were a couple of other questions about RDM kit, which you've missed. Oh, um, I missed it. Yes, there was one question about uh, who has control of the country specific yeah. pages in the RDM kit. Um, and there's another question. I'll just quickly say to that is, uh, so for now, um, in the Elixir, we have a data management uh, working groups for data management networks for all countries. And for now, we have reached out to them, the lead of those data management working groups to provide country specific information. But as I said, that RDM kit is a community project. So anybody is welcome to join. So if there is, uh, if, if you would like to contribute for your country page, please get in touch with us. Uh, so that is one question. There was another um, that I thought. I, I just followed that up. So the only reason I asked that question really was because ha having worked for a funder in the past, I'm quite aware that every Oxford comma is important to some of them. <laughs> and, um, you know, that there might be there's this, this potential script for misinterpretation. So I just wondered whether they were, they were put past funders. Uh, or they, they re exactly reflected what the funders were saying or whether there was a, a degree of interpretation there. Yeah, so uh, what we when we mean uh, by the, I'll just clarify what we mean by the national resources page. One is there are general tools and information out there which is applicable to everybody, but then there are country specific things and country specific data management resources. Um, so if you see in there is a page for your country and it is missing, um, uh, please raise a GitHub issue and we will uh, we will check that and we will have have a discussion on our GitHub site. Okay, it's not quite the same question. Uh, maybe I was misinterpreting the pages, but I thought there was something about policies there. Yeah, there is there is about funders policies like in the UK page we have from the Welcome Fund or the um, you know UKRN. What what are their uh, subscriptions about uh, and policies about data management? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I have. Yeah, no, so, so you, so you point, I haven't. I know I should have looked at it, but that would be easier. But um, so do they do. They point to the, directly to the policies, do they? They don't. Yes, they point. To, they point to the policies. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I didn't. I didn't read it. So I should have read it. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's all right. No worries. Thanks. So we'll be going for a really short break. Um, of about five minutes. We'll be back at two o'clock for the second part of the workshop. But I see that there might be a couple of questions that are still unanswered from Tony and someone else, if I'm not wrong, from Martin, that I'm sure Manasa or Alison can answer directly to you on the chat later on. And if not, um, I bet that you both are very happy to answer any further questions to your email addresses as well. Yeah, I've answered in the chat, but do get in touch if you want, Tony, if you have any other questions. The answer is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. So we'll see you all in five minutes. Get a really quick coffee, a tea, whichever thing you want, and we'll be back with the projects. So hello again to everyone. I see Will has put already a message as well on the chat. Hope you all had a nice little break. You were able to stretch a bit, get some coffee, some tea, and then we are ready to start for the second part of the workshop. We're going to be presenting a few of the projects, like I mentioned before, that are um, creating training materials around data management and are part of the same pot of funding from UKRI. So I hope you find this useful and you make use of the resources that we'll be presenting to you today here. So um, this time I'll be introducing myself. So you've heard me before and haven't really introduced myself. I'm Shania Perezica and I'm the Data Stewardship Community Manager at the University of Bradford, part of Elixir UK. And I'm gonna be introducing to you today the Elixir UK Dash project. This is a project of a fellowship data stewards that are delivering training. And so I'm here today to present our work. But before we go into the nitty gritty details, I want to set the scene, the big picture, something that I think we can all here relate to. So some of you may know that St. George is the patron of England. A few months ago when the celebration day took place, it inspired me to talk about a project as the story of St. George and the dragon. So for those of you who don't know the tale, legend has it that a dragon was terrorizing the local people of a village. 
And so to appease the creature, they began to give tributes and sacrifice animals to fit its hunger until they no longer had any. And so then the king decreed that they must offer the local children to keep the dragon at bay. And each day the lottery chose the sacrifice until the king's daughter, the very princess, was selected. And as she was being left dragon, George happened by. And horrified by what he discovered, he offered to slay the dragon and rescue the village from its claws and fire. So what does this have to do with data stewardship, right? Well, while I was thinking about this, I realized that each public institution in the UK, be it a university, a research institute, ministries, hospitals, you name it, they are our castles. And in this story, there's this by a dragon that feeds on data. So each day we keep it at bay by giving away our attributes, our data from projects from research, not even in a way that we want to give it away, but because we don't take into consideration data management. And so it is until the point that we realize that we're losing too much, that we're losing our princess, the invaluable tribute we can't afford to lose, that we don't act on it. And so our knights, our St. George's are our data stewards. And when I say data stewards, I'm not referring to only those few with such a title, but every single researcher, professor, bioinformatician that dedicates a fair amount of their time managing data and safeguarding its reuse. And I'm pretty sure many of you here will, will have that role in your own organizations. So who are the dragons in this story? Well, there's a dragon for every castle. And in the project, we have identified at least three common dragons, three hurdles. So the first time is clearly time and funding, limited resources and staff funding that goes away with each political means of distribution of wealth. I don't need to explain it. I'm sure everyone here knows the struggle. There's also a second problem of buy-in. If our kings and queens, the senior leadership do not realize we're losing our princesses, then we'll lose her because no one will look for a St. George to come and help us rescue that data. And then number three, the skills, the capacity building that is vital. We can't really afford to keep hiring staff, but we need to train the existing workforce and a highly qualified workforce in the UK in their fields, yet mostly unaware of, of data management. And that again takes time and funding. So you'll be thinking that I'm just here coming to tell you, well, we are the St. George's that are gonna come here and rescue you and that will happen to pass by, right? This is, this is where the story does, we're far from that. Here is where our proposition is different from the legend. We believe there is a St. George in each and every castle. The problem is they have no weapons. And um, what is a knight to do against a dragon without a sword? So we propose a fellowship of ambassadors, a fellowship made up of every single data steward in every single castle and to empower them with the tools and to share the knowledge and research data management in their own organizations. So if we look again to the three great hurdles to the dragons that seize our castles, what is this fellowship really doing to tackle this? So first of all, we had the buy-in. And when it comes to achieving this buy-in from senior leadership, a single voice is often not enough. So we are aiming to target a wide range of fellows at different career stages and in many diverse fields within the life sciences, we don't put a stop to who can apply to become a fellow. And if you look at our current fellows right now working with us, we have people that are junior early career researchers and meet recognized researchers. We also have a really good representation of gender. We have nearly 50-50 um, of gender in our group and also there's a great variety of people of different backgrounds many of them identify themselves as researchers working with data but some others also identify themselves as core support by informaticians data stewards facility operators and also software engineers then the second problem that we have is the time and funding so the project has committed to providing a small honorarium payments to the fellows the time they spend on our activities goes beyond their full-time jobs. And so they are paid an honorarium for these extra hours that they will employ in creating training materials throughout our fellowship and training on data management in their organizations. So this means that their contributions don't impact in their daily jobs as much as um, it would do if they were not part of this fellowship. But at the same time, we're benefiting and leveraging their influence in their organizations they belong to. 
And third, this skills. So this is probably the most important one. We are creating a fellowship, but how are we bridging the skill and the knowledge gap? So first of all, we are, we need to, to make those fellows become the trainers to deliver training locally. We don't expect all fellows to be expert trainers. This is a clear example of the project providing the tools to this St. George's and their castles. Every fellow must complete the Elixir Trainer Trainer course, for example, as you can see here in my slide. And this will provide them to, with these initial tools to become the ambassadors at their own institutions. And we also have two in-house trainers um, in Bradford at the university that support the fellows in their activities and help develop courses around basic data management topics. So for example, this one here that you can see on verifying, verifying your data is still under development, but it will soon be released. And this is using the carpentries, which I guess many of you here already know, but for those of you who don't, these courses are completely available because these are on the carpentries. So anyone can make use of this beyond our fellows, beyond our fellowships. And then finally, this is probably our key flagship outcome in this, in this project are the RD and Bytes. A rather innovative approach for data management in the life sciences, though quite frankly, a tactic that is well spread. If you think about TikTok or Instagram, really videos are everywhere. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We are merlying something that we know works for an online audience. And so this, this videos are called the RD and Bytes and they are again, completely open, completely reusable, like the courses and we are producing more than a hundred of these videos of only two and five minutes. The fellows are producing these videos as well, together with the, the, the support of our trainers, the support of our members in the project. Actually, one of them, Munaza, who has presented the RDM kit, she's also part of our project. And she's, she's one of the leading voices here as well in, in how to create this RDM bytes in a way that is accurate and engaging. So again, this is, approachable for many different audiences from beginner to intermediate level because we are using fellows at many different levels. And for general topics around data sensitivity, data management, but also for very specific ones, for example, for resources, demos and data management like RedCap. And so these videos that are fellows being released in, in YouTube right now in the Lexi UK channel that are completely open, like I mentioned. These videos live on YouTube and have been also categorized so that people can go through them. You can play them into playlists. You don't have to watch them all. You don't have to search them for ages because as I mentioned, there's a hundred videos that are gonna be released. So what I would like to do is to encourage you all to scan the QR code or go into the playlist link that I'll put shortly in the chat as well and subscribe to our channel and maybe have a look at our short videos on your way back home if you're in the office today or during your lunch break tomorrow. And needless to say, if you find this relevant to your current needs, training courses, or know someone that could profit from watching them, please do share or do get in touch with me because we really want to embed this and all the resources of the project everywhere, everywhere we can. So for example, we'll be embedded on the Fair Cookbook or they will be embedded in the RDM kit as well. So as you can see, all the resources that we're presenting here today, they're very much intertwined and we don't expect users to just know one resource and be able to reach all other ones as well. And finally, I'd like to thank all the project team members and also the support from UK around here today from um, Bradford, Carzit, Manchester, Oxford and Erlem. And as you can see, Manassas there as well, um, because it's been, it's been really um, a great voice in delivering all these RDM bytes and being able to embed this in the RDM kit as well. So thank you very much. So, so sharing, and I'd, I'd like to now let Thomas to introduce the other Dash project that is also delivering training materials around data mining. So please, Thomas, if you can start your presentation, uh, I'm thrilled to yes. hear you. So I first, I share some two links. I will not have to stop during the presentation. One will be to the workshop, one to the materials, and I will share the screen. Maybe. So I hope you can see my presentation. If not, please could protest. And I hope I'm on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me here um, and present our, our training um, workshops or the idea of the training courses. 
I can um, confirm that you know uh, we actually heavily uh, promote uh, fair sharing as the very useful resources for finding um, uh, standards and databases where you can uh, deposit your data. And my presentation is called Fair in uh, Carpentry Start Practice because we are trying to teach fair in practice, how to do it in a practical workshop with this carpentry style, which I will talk a bit more in a second. I can change the slide. Um, so we are, we, we are part of the project called uh, It Dash, and we got almost 400,000 pounds to, to actually develop the new training materials. So another training materials about the fair uh, topics and data management. But the novelty here is that uh, it's, it was designed to, to fit into carpentry styles, uh, again, carpentry style format, uh, which is uh, more interactive. Uh, we've been finding to deliver almost 100 days of, of this training. And also because the specificity of carpentry platform is that by delivering those workshops, we actually train new instructors and we, we create a base of, uh, of um, professional teachers who can actually deliver and spread those materials uh, uh, without our engagement. We also offer a clinic for learners so we can actually help to solve them the, their own problems. Um, and there are three areas of, of the EdDash uh, courses. So first is computational workflows. It's actually very long, four days intensive um, uh, a course that starts with uh, using command lines and how to manage packages for R and Python, and finally how to create the workflows. So they actually reproducible analysis pipelines. There's a package about statistics that starts with the basic intermediate statistics, um, goes to high dimensional statistics, and finally machine learning. And the course that I'm involved with is dedicated to open science fair and data management, and we have two of them. So first is fair in biological practice. So it's two days course, but we tend to deliver it as the four afternoons. And it's dedicated for um, a lab practitioner, people who still do the, the active research. And we also have another angle for fair for leaders. So people who we know will never deposit the data uh, to the repository because they don't have time, but they should know uh, how to tell people to deposit data to the repository and what to, should require from their own minions. So the magical carpentries, I mentioned it because many times of explanation and I, I know some of you will know it because you already mentioned uh, in the previous talk, but um, it's been designed, it started for actually teaching software and programming skills for, uh, for not programmers, I would say. And, and the whole idea of, uh, it started with the software, but even adapted for the, then the data library and, and more topics. So they are very so practical workshops. So it's not the lectures, but actually the, the, the core point is that always have to have hands-on experience. There's always an instructor who delivers the content, but there's also helpers who actually, if the learner have a problem, so if you kind of solve the, uh, the, the problem that they you know, program, then the, the, the helper can come over and, and try to um, solve the issues and explain what the difference. So, you're not stuck. You have always someone there who help. And at the same time, it doesn't interrupt the main delivery. And um, it's been created with the idea of the live coding. So actually instructor, when they, when they teach programming, uh, they do type, they don't show the screenshots, which means they, they commit typical errors and mistakes. And, and, and trust me, you don't have to fake those errors. They actually happen naturally. You forget the semicolon, you misspell something. Um, so uh, learners already see what, what can go wrong and how the instructor fix the issue that, when they encounter. And, and the whole workshop is around the problem solving. So you have a little challenges, the task that the, the, the learners have to uh, solve to actually learn or practice the new skills. And all the materials are always peer reviewed and open and collaborative. So basically there's a GitHub web pages where, where, where you can uh, collaborate on, on the content. The other peculiarities is called backwater design and uh, backwards, sorry, but yes, I could do call it backwater. So you actually start with the learner's profile. You think who's your audience and it's very important because it's practical, which means if you want to, for example, teach GitHub, you have to assume that people already know how to use the command line. Um, so those, those, those focus, or we assume if we're going to teach the PIs, we know that they will not do those things themselves, but they will delegate. Then you think what are the objectives and the practical skills that you actually want to teach. 
And, and then you design about those, those objectives, the, the challenges, the problems that should be solved during this workshop. And once you have all of it, you actually start writing content. So you actually work on those slides and you work on the text for the website. So that's why it's called, uh, because the content goes last. Um, so fair in biological practice, it's, as I mentioned before, we aim as the practitioner, the people who are still working in the lab, generate the data. Well, it doesn't have to be the lab because we also have the kind of computational module. Uh, but people who generate the data and who probably will be responsible to actually make those data fair and, and deposit them. Uh, and we teach them how to practically apply those fair principles. So um, I would say well, we still don't have technologies for all the domains and, 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 and tools to, to help everyone, but at least how to think in a fair way when you work. So you're ready to make your outputs uh, fair available at the end. And, and we try to make it practical by either, you know, forcing users to click through the resources and showing them an example. Um, so I, before in, a, in the chat room, I, I shared the link to, to the course material. You can have a look how it looks once it's rendered. Um, it's not how we deliver, but this is what the instructor will learn from. And I will give example of those exercises that we do. So there was this exercise that we do for introducing fair concept. Uh, so we divide the people in the groups, they were in a group and they are given um, two different tasks. So first one is called impossible protocol. Um, so we were asked to be to find how to make the Western broad with very big uh, protein. And the protocol to do it is actually from the uh, vendor website. Uh, and they only are begin in five minutes and we tell them, this is how you work. You, you know, you don't read the whole paper to find them, you know, protocol. Uh, and you're five of you in a group, so you can actually split, you know, design and split and, 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 and concur, and you should be able to do it. And this, and we give them the hints how to navigate. Um, the other task is called impossible average. So it's basically making use of the um, numerical data, which accompany the papers, so some metabolites data, which were available as a supplementary information. And we just ask people to calculate the simple average. Um, so what happens is in the first example, you discover that the, the, the paper referenced the material metals, another paper, which referenced another paper, which finally referenced the third paper on which you, you will see that actually the, this, this Western blood is being done according to standard methods. Um, so it's completely dead end and the standard methods do not apply here because this protein is very, very large. And they're also, depending where the students do the course from, um, one of those um, uh, publications behind the paywall. So not everyone even can get to the loops. And, and those examples basically introduce the concept, for example, heel of the, of the FAIR principle, because the protocol was difficult to find because it doesn't have its own identity, it was difficult to access because it wasn't in there, um, behind the paywall, uh, and it was not reusable because it didn't have any details that you want to use. And the second one of the numerical uh, data shows the problem with the interoperable and reusable because the numerical data, you could have just copy them to, to Excel because the, when you try to select them and copy them, they completely messed up. And, and even finding the right column to, to copy was an issue because the, the, the headers are obscure. Um, the whole full content of the course is, is more or less here. So we introduce the basic concepts. We also talk about the problems of openness and intellectual properties. Uh, we talk about metadata and different forms of representing them. Uh, we touch on ontologies. And surprisingly, students like it, but it's very difficult to do it in, in one hour. Uh, we talk how to tidy organize data and metadata in tables, how to keep electronic lab records or records in general how work with the files, different conventions. We do a bit of the programming, introducing the notebooks and without any programming skills, uh, students are happy and to learn that they can actually make the reproducible plots. And we talk about version content, templating, public repositories, and we teach how to write data management plans. Um, so this is the outcome and it's actually very, very positive. So you can see here examples of some of the student testimonies when they ask them, you know, what you like the most from the course, what you learned from it. And if each of the students will introduce just one of the things that they, that they typed, you know, we'll be super happy because it's, it's exactly the impact we want to teach people. I really like it that someone says uh, that I will be thinking as the, um, uh, where I have it. Yeah, 
I will be thinking as the user of my data, not as a creator, because I think it's one of the problem with you know publishing that people don't think of the consumers. Uh, there's some practicalities of how to name the files or, or what does it mean to back up your files. So as you can see, this is all the things they would like to know people to learn. And, and, and some of them, they pick it up on themselves what they're going to take after the course. Um, also, there is the course is received very well. So the feedback is super positive. Obviously, there were some negative few comments, but usually they come to timing. You know, it was not enough breaks or but we couldn't, we couldn't give more time actually. Uh, so people love the examples, people love the interactivity that we have. Uh, they actually found the balance between the, what we talk and what we, and the practical is also what we think that should happen and what is actually happening. So, you know, our opinions, it's, uh, it's really well received. So we are super pleased with when this course works that actually learners are, are very happy and engaged. Um, but, Okay, I call the reflections that on the end, everything is so, so simple. So the, the call, and during the call, we already, this, you know, we, we, we designed those course about online delivery. It was the time of the COVID, so there's no other way of doing it, but we heavily depend on it. So it re really works well when you do it online. I don't think we could deliver them in the, in the real life because there's too much overhead, like splitting the people in the groups, move around in the rooms, or, um, asking people to speak out what they think rather to type in the notepad uh, their thoughts. Uh, it just, it's faster. And we, we really depend on those uh, online technologies. On, from my perspective, this carpentry style, this interactivity, those problem solving, um, it creates a lot of overhead. Uh, it, it really, so we have four afternoons, it's two full days. And I would say you could probably do it as the PowerPoint presentation in three hours, maybe you know, in one day if you, not just the presentation, but not so much uh, going back and forward in students, because if they give you the answers, you also have to have a look at those answers and you know assess them. It's not, you should not leave your student just to answer and assume they did it right in the group. So, so there's a lot of extra time that is into this format, but as you see from the feedback, students actually appreciate. Um, so while the course itself works really well, um, there's another thing is like the topic of fair data management, you may not believe it being for this of this workshop, does not attract a lot of interest. So it's 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 not the most popular course that's been offered. Statistic is so much more popular. And um, and I can understand it because if the people see that they have to dedicate two days of their life to data management, it, it, it just feels excessive. But um, but you need those two days, you need more. And we know it, but um, people prioritizing and probably they will go for two days of NGS course, not in data management. So, so this format works really well once you get the students on board, uh, but it also costs us to, to get students on board because they see, oh, come on, it's the two days, it's not two hours. Um, so I also put the link in the chat. We're having a new edition in the next month. So maybe you want to advertise it or maybe you want to try to see how it works yourself. And the other courses are available uh, on our main Dash project website. And just acknowledgement. So it's a lot of people involved actually to develop this content. We had the, it's actually proper collaborative content. So on the left side are people who did the work on the right side, are people who make this happen, but getting us the money or helping out with some uh, practicalities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. That was a great presentation. I, I can already see some of the questions in the chat that we can answer later in the Q&A, but I'd like Evelyn to welcome you to the stage to present your use case on how to implement fair data and training materials. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Sini just said, I'm going to be talking about um, the project I work on, which is called Cloudspan and how we're... So I'll talk a little bit about Cloudspan as a project. Um, but mostly I'm, I'll be telling you about how we've been using the FAIR principles uh, in, within the project to kind of make our project FAIR. So the idea of Cloudspan is that it's about use, teaching people to use cloud computing to do mostly genomic style sort of analysis. Um, we work most, so the lab we work with is in the field of environmental genomics. So they work with uh, like lots of wastewater treatment, that sort of thing. Um, so the main problem they have is that their data sets are really, really big. Um, and that means that 
getting access to the right kind of hardware can be very difficult. Um, when you do get access to it, you might have to, we, so York, which is where the project is based, does have a very good uh, HPC, high performance computing cluster, but uh, you can have, you might have to queue for a really long time to be able to access those resources. Um, so they've had to queue sometimes for several months in order to get the amount of compute that they need to run their analysis. And then also for new people who are new to the, to this kind of analysis, even things like installing the software in the right way can put, pose a massive challenge. There's this is huge uh, barrier to participation. And then there's also a big skills gap. So lots of biologists don't know lots about high performance computing. And um, it's something that they perhaps haven't really encountered before they have to do their first analysis as part of their PhD or postdoc. So the idea of CloudSpan is that the solution to these problems is cloud computing because rather than it being a cluster that you sort of like um, have to queue to join, you, you basically pay for what you use and the amount of time that you use. And then and then we also, the other solution to the skills gap is, as you'd expect, training people. So CloudSpan brings together those two things. It's training people to use cloud, cloud computing for these complex analysis. And just an example of, as an example of the kind of uh, courses that we run, the main course we run is genomics. Um, which talk is a, uh, basically runs through a workflow for look, like looking at a genome and call, finding where there's variation in it. And um, Pronomics we designed to go before genomics because we found that most people didn't come in with any knowledge of using the command line um, or navigating a file system, that kind of thing. So Pronomics is a two half day course that runs before genomics. Genomics is four half days. Um, Metagenomics is our, the course we're about to start running in November, and that's a month long course, but there's two drop ins a week. Um, and that's because the analyses for metagenomics take a really long time to run. So we can't run it as like a one course where you just run it for half a day or a day. And then we have various other courses. So this is about creating cloud instances in order to do these courses outside of the talk course. Um, and the stuff about experimental design and automation and pipelines. And the way we run these courses is very similar to Eddash. So we use the Carpentries live coding style with lots of exercises and interactivity. We mostly run our courses, we've run all our courses, in fact, online so far, although genomics, our next, the next one, which is in December, will be in person. Um, and metagenomics, we can't run in person because, as I said, the uh, amount of data being processed is just too huge. We, it would we it wouldn't make sense for people to come here and do the analysis. So again, for us, the online format does work well, but we are experimenting a little bit with in-person workshops. But just to go to talk more generally about CloudSpan as a project, sorry, to talk about how we're implementing FAIR principles, I thought I'd go through the four sort of like main areas, F, A, I, and R, and tell you and show you how we've been implementing those things. So. I'm sure you've already heard about the FAIR principle, so I won't go into lots of detail about like what findable means. Um, but these are just some examples. This basically is how we're implementing that in our project. So the first thing in terms of findability is making sure that all of our resources are tagged with rich metadata. So this is the markdown for our the sort of like main page of our phonomics course. And you can see here we're using this bio schemas format, which allows you to like structure your metadata in a way that's sort of like a standard protocol for doing that. And then I thought, sorry, I thought I had an example of what that looked like on the web page, but basically this is then taken, it's, a, it's toasted on a GitHub pages thing and it takes this and then turns it into something that uh, like a uh, browser can read basically, uh, or that a database can read. Um, the other thing is that we tag all of our resources with DOIs, so we use the Nodo for that. So this is the readme of, the, again, the first part of the Ponomics module. And you can see here, there's a button here which takes you, which has the DOI and it takes you to the Zenodo page, which looks like this. And then th that, but doing that allows us to tag it with this DOI. And that means that it's sort of like persistent and the DOI will always exist. So that helps with findability. And the final thing is registering with some kind of uh, repository. So we've registered currently only Pronomics, but we're getting there with the others because they're just not quite ready yet, with um, 
test, which is the Elixir training portal. So this is what the phonomics page looks like for that. Um, it basically takes the metadata that I showed at the start of this slide and then turns it into this listing, which means that people can search for our course. Um, for, if they were searching for courses for PhD students, then they'd be able to do that. Um, or I think further down on this page, there's like topics, so things like genomics, cloud computing, uh, shell, <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, that's all that sort of thing means that they can be searched for, and that really helps with findability. So the next thing is accessibility. And really the main thing here is that all of our all of our courses are free. Um, that's the way we run them and are freely available online. So the main thing is just that we host them in a, on a, in a standard internet format like you'd expect so that anybody with a browser can access them and that's really for in, in our context that's kind of as much as that I, I, there's not a lot more I, I, maybe people in the panel could share more about how we what we could do in terms of accessibility um but because our course because our materials are freely available anyway um we state that on all of the materials and in the metadata and they're in a format that's accessible so interoperability um one thing that we do is that when we use different files so different obviously we use various different we work with lots of different files as part of the course and when we do work with a file we make sure that they're the de facto standard for the field so for example we use a lot of fastq files which is basically um like a readout from a sequencing like from a sequencer so this is a very poor sequence um because there's lots of ends and just one nucleoside uh, but this 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 format of displaying them where it's you've four lines and then each each basically each read has four four lines of information about it and this is the standard way of doing it so we're introducing people to that standard and encouraging them to use it we also write all of our courses in markdown which is a sort of standard that can be displayed across lots of different uh like systems basically um so this is what the markdown looks like of the first page of first lesson in phonomics. Um, you I would imagine you've probably seen things like it before. And that, as I say, that means it can be interpreted, even if you try and read it in via, a, like just through a command line, not even through a browser, you can still read it and it won't come out all um, sort of gobbledygook because of the HTML. And then finally, in terms of interoperability with our metadata, we use this Bio, so we use the bioschemas format, which is a sort of standard in biology. And when one of the things in the metadata here is like the topics that it's related to, and we use this EDAM ontology, so like a controlled vocabulary, and um, these two correspond to genomics and software engineering, which was as close as we could get to like bioinformatics, basically, in the topics of the EDAM ontology. But that means that it's when people so in the test repository when you're trying to search for different things it's all standardized so that there's a set list of topics that it can be assigned to and we've chosen these topics for this course and then here yeah this is what this so this is what this is the genomics um like page of the ontology so it's genomics but it also can be known by all these other names it's got a definition it's all very defined and that means that it's interoperable between different like systems and then finally reusability so i've already shown you our metadata and that's one of the main things about that's what that's a big thing in reusability is having richly described metadata um we also have a we also all of our materials are available under a creative commons license so uh a creative commons 4 which basically means that um you can share and adapt it as long as you credit and that's sort of like the one of it's not the most open license you can have but it's sort of like the next one down so we do ask people to credit us but other than that people are free to use our materials in any way they want and again that's stated in all on all of the github repos and the license it's stated in the actual text of the course and here yeah as i say this is this is on the course website uh so anybody it's it's in the bar it's in the bar at the top so anybody can go on the license and read what the terms are of the license basically and that's also stated in our metadata so here on all of the courses 
it tells you what the license is. And then finally, we also ask our learners to contribute um, and encourage them to use our resources. And um, that's not something I have an example of, but when we're teaching, we tell people that they're allowed to use our resources because not everyone will know what a Creative Commons 4.0 license is. So there's also a verbal element to it, telling people what it what that means and and, and encouraging them to reuse our resources um, in their own institutions. So that's kind of my like very brief summary of what we're doing in our project. There's definitely more we can do, but that's kind of what we've a year in, that's how far we've got. Um, I know there's a panel, so if you have any questions, then feel free to ask them then. If you want to contact me, this is my email address here. And if you're interested in any of our courses, um, then you can find all of them, find out more about them and register on our website, which is cloud-span.york.ac.uk. And so we have a metagenomics course running next month. There's a genomics and a phenomics course running at the start of December. Uh, and there'll be other courses running over the next year as well, because the, the project has another approximately nine months to run. And you can also do all of the courses uh, as a self-study option as well. So if you can't make the actual course, then uh, you can just do it like online and just work through, work through the resources like that. They're all designed to not need, not need like live teaching. So yeah, if you are interested or if you would like to share them with anybody in your network, then that would be that would be great. Uh, we always, obviously, we want to share this with as many people as possible. So thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Evelyn. So that that concludes all our talks for today. So we just have our panel discussion now with the Q and A from all of you, and. I can already see a question here that may apply to all of us, actually. I think, Thomas, you've already replied to John about whether someone from outside the UK can join your courses. I think what is important to say here is that obviously this is a UK RI funded project, so it's tailored to a UK audience, but at least from, from our side, from the Lixi UK Dash side, anything that we, we create, it will be specifically tailored for locally delivery for anything that happens online, any courses that we put on the carpentry. As Evelyn was saying, you can always go through them on your own time, even though you don't attend the course. So really this is this is for anyone to take it and reuse it. Thomas, is that your your case as well? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yes, so you know, we are we are carpentry, so everyone can take it. We actually had already deliveries uh, outside. Uh, I could not help with them. So I know that the people just took those materials and just ran with them. Um, we don't have UK specific tools actually, so we're thinking of having like a module that just talks about what is in UK, but actually we, we don't see anything which is just just UK, so actually they're very general. The only thing is that the workshop, you know, because actually we are being paid for delivery, they're advertised in UK, but uh, if there are spaces left, you know, people always can try to sign up. Uh, you know, we want to have the full room. Those courses really work better if we have full rooms. Surprisingly, the, the more the better. But officially, we are not advertising it outside the, the world. But they are general. We are not. We thought they will have some content, but yeah, we could not think of anything that has to because you know, the first sharing is for everyone, even if it's funded. You know, UK cookbook as well. John, I can see your hand up. Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's obviously that's fair enough. Like that. I think there, there's, there probably would be interest in different countries in running this course, and maybe it would be good for those people who run it to talk to you about the best way to do it, because it's clearly best done in, in, in a live context, right? So it's best, best, best to be done with a trainer who understands the course and who, who's maybe talked to you about how it works and that kind of thing. But so I, I obviously understand it's not a, it's, it's designed for the UK. I think as well that um, we would be open to anyone wanting to attend these, obviously not not having the, the capacity to deliver it and promote it outside the UK, but anyone that is outside the UK that wants to attend any of these meetings and courses, if they happen online, at least from, from Elixir UK Dash, would be happy to do that. And I can see um, Thomas, you nodding. So I guess that that's your case as well, and Evelyn as well. I should also say, John, that we we are also in contact with other Elixir nodes, so this is this is going to be shared. Okay, that's great. Thanks. 
I see as well another question on the chat. I think this was for Thomas, whether this is only for quantitative data, quality data. I think you already answered something on the chat, Thomas, but I don't know if you want to add anything yeah, else. I can, um, so yeah, the, the focus probably is more on the uh, quantitative data because it's more common, but uh, we also quite general because we, you know, that's what one of the problems. You, you want to be practical, but you cannot assume that people just use one technique. So. I would say half of the materials applies everywhere. And we exactly talk, you know, when we talk about what is the data, we say that people, it's not just the Excel tables, it's also, you know, video recordings, interviews. It's a lot of things there which are, uh, uh, so I think it's it's useful for, regardless of, of what type of the research that people do in our course. So I want, I want to add, also something else, because I, I know Evelyn also has mentioned about accessibility of the training materials. And I know that she mentioned tests and we haven't really talked about tests throughout the entire session, but I think it's important to tell you that anything that we're producing, we are aiming to put it on tests, which is a portal that um, I'm sure Manasa will probably want to say something else about this because she's the community manager of this, this resource, but anything you can so, yeah. find. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that. it's a portal for putting all your training materials and events related to <coughs> data management training. So um, everything that is training or information related to uh, data management uh, is found on the test portal. So test basically is the uh, training portal for Elixir. Yeah, brilliant. Have I missed any any other question? If not, I think just Chris, please feel free to, uh, uh, yeah. Chris has got his Chris, hand up. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I just wanted to make a quick comment on that. I think uh, Evelyn uh, showed a very nice example of how to use bioschemas, right? Yeah, in, uh, and basically, if you are using bioschemas, right? Yeah, this allows you to for your content to be available and scrubbed by tests. I think that was very nice, right? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. So is there any other questions? If not, I do have a comment and a question for, for as well, Alison and Manasa from you earlier. Because <laughs> I think we, we've been talking about bridging the, the skill gap in the second session, but I think it's important to talk about who is the target audience for the fair cookbook, for fair sharing, for the RDM kid. You, you've mentioned that it's for many different roles in the life sciences. I'd like to talk a little bit about the difficulty because I find that some people find this overwhelming when you talk about data management and I think it's it's good if you share a little bit about how accessible these tools are and even for people that are just starting up if you want to say something about difficulty yeah it's it's a, something we've been thinking a lot about in both fair sharing and fair cookbook I think fair cookbook answers it by giving a sort of gentle entry point when you first go to the fair cookbook site it gives you some options about how to enter and find the recipes. The search wizard I showed in one of the slides is a more advanced interface. Um, for fair sharing, at the moment, we primarily have, we have documentation that explains about the records and we have the records themselves with a, with a very complete set of search facets. However, what we're missing is what Manaza was talking about for RDM kit and what we have for fair cookbook, which is this more gentle introduction. And in fact, we have a developer working on that new gentler introduction as we speak. So there is going to be a new sort of entry point to fair sharing that will be stakeholder specific and will ask some very broad questions to the user coming saying, how would you, you know, are you looking for a place to put your data or are you looking for a uh, to align with a journal policy so you can submit to a manuscript to a publisher so we're going to sort of um, guide the user more gently into the fair sharing search results because i think that's one thing that we've wanted to do for a while but haven't had the opportunity and now we do so you you will all be able to see that in the next six months sort of appearing a nice visualization of of what's in in fair sharing and the ability to sort of graphically navigate through it. Uh, the, the relationship graphs are all, graphs are already there. Every single record has its relationships displayed in a in a graph, but this is going to be one step further. Uh, so I think from the RDM kit point of view, it's more simpler. Uh, 
compared to the uh, fair cookbook or fair sharing or um so the as i said it's an overall uh, overarching umbrella kind of information under which everything is integrated and when you talk about specific integrations if you're like how we are linked to a uh, fair cookbook or how we are linked to the other tools and registries it is in context of the information that you're looking for i will i think i showed it in my slides and i'll repeat it again that depending on the kind of information related to data management that you're looking for whether it is data management planning or you're looking for any any data management related to your specific domain so that is how we link in so it's more specific for us so you'll find links from fair sharing or um, fair cookbook recipes so if there is a fair cookbook recipe on how to verify for example your imaging data or microbial biotechnology data so you'll find these in this information linked into the pages that are uh, specific to these kind of topics on the RDM kit. So it, it's more simpler for us. It, it's not as complicated for us as the uh, other resources because you're providing a broad overview of everything. And uh, does that answer your question, Shania? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It's, I, I have to say that myself, as someone that is not a data manager, data steward, I'm a community manager, going through the RDM kit is very easy to follow. And it, I think it was, a year ago when you started this and I started reading it, I thought, well, this is this is fantastic. For the first time, I knew how to name my files. So really for, for uh, So yeah, so um, I'll just add to this. That, so even if I would say that even if you're uh, wanting to use Fair Cookbook, even there, there is a backlink to RDM kit uh, telling you. So if you want to get a good, good understanding from the beginning, um, so why am I why am I using this recipe or why am I following these particular steps or why do I need to use a fair sharing? If you do not have an understanding of that, that is where RDM Kit will help you get started. And you know because everything is cross-linked, so whether you start from the uh, fair cookbook, you will be able to get back to RDM Kit. And if you start from RDM Kit, you will be directed to uh, fair cookbook. Um, so it's uh, I think uh, if you want to start with a basic understanding, then start with RDM Kit. Thanks. Thanks, Manassas. I think that that also answers a question from Tony earlier on the chat that was saying, how do you link this, all these resources? Where do you start? Where do you go to? So the, the fact that you can swap between resource, depending on the level you are at and what you need at the moment, that, that is great. So if, if he was asking from the point of view how we do it, uh, so I, I might go a bit into the technical information here, which is like we, for example, with RDM Kit, uh, between RDM Kit, Fair Cookbook and DSW, we have joint editorial board meetings. Uh, so when content is put up on, we also have when somebody is putting up content on RDM Kit, there are, there are templates that need to be followed. And in those templates, there are sections where you're asked that is your section linked to any recipe in the Fair Cookbook or can this be directed to DSW? So we start from uh, integration at the basic point of when we are putting in information. And then this gets also checked in. Now there's a more automated process for it, um, but that is how we start uh, right from the beginning. Thank you, Manasa. Well, I think I don't see any more comments, but if you do have a final question, please raise your hand or just speak up. If not, I think we can finish the talk for today. And I hope you really enjoyed this workshop. I really enjoyed hearing from, from all of you. I knew many of what has been presented today, but really I've learned more than what I, what I had already in mind. So thanks very much for joining. So um, see you all next time. And thanks very much for attending here today. And thanks very much for the speakers as well for coming in today.